All right, today we're looking at Watts 3020 node 2. So this is part of the introduction to JavaScript. We're working on the command line. We've installed node in a previous module. We've done some programming with variables, types, truthy, falsy, if then else, logical expressions, template literals. And now we're ready to look at objects, arrays, functions, and iteration. So we get, we're going to have iteration and looping. So we'll see that iteration works for uh, ordered list, and then looping can work for, for both, really. I mean, the concept of looping is just moving through some kind of an object. We'll also see that um, both uh, that arrays are objects in uh, JavaScript, but they are ordered list, you know, they, they work as ordered list, whereas objects are not ordered. They are just key value pairs. Um, you can do quick lookup on a key. Um, you can do quick lookup by index or number in the, in the ordered list for array. So, and then functions are ways to encapsulate some code if we're going to be running the same chunk of code over and over again, especially when we're dealing with different types of iteration and looping. We like functions. And we'll do some work with uh, algorithms. And um, we'll also be using events um, as we are going to be using. Uh, we're going to continue to use get args just to pull single arguments off the command line. But we'll also bring in prompts and the ability to uh, detect that a user has hit the line feed. You know, like the ent entered a you know, prompt has been displayed, user has entered data and hit the enter key. We'll be able to detect, detect that event and run code based on that. And then when we're done due to some logical condition, we will be able to close out. We'll also see that we'll have an IO print function, which behaves exactly like console log. It's basically going to put data out to the command line um, with a new line character. So we've got our IO covered here. And there's a little discussion here. Really hope that you read all of this and look at the basic pattern for, for, for prompting, where you set a prompt, and then you call the prompt, and then you listen for that carriage return. And then you can keep prompting, or you can call close, and then process the close. Uh, so we're going to read about JavaScript objects and object processing we're using the for in syntax. It allows you to loop through your um, keys in your key value pairs. It's not guaranteed that the order will be the same. It's not an ordered list. But JavaScript, you'll see that we have a similar ability only using a for of syntax. So with this uh, for of, we can uh, loop through our array and, um, and then uh, produce that. Um, so we talk about looping, and looping is just uh, walking through a data structure. Um, iteration usually refers to an ordered data structure. We talk about iterables, but um, you will see some examples of that. And then JavaScript functions, we have the function syntax, and then we have the um, we have the arrow syntax. So we'll take a look at, at that as well. So for the tutorials here. We're going to be looking um, at FizzBuzz, which is a really common kind of interview question type to, uh, sort of algorithm that uses modulo to you know, basically answer the question, uh, is this divisible by 3, 5, or 15? So if it's divisible by 15, it's divisible by both 3 and 5. So we'll look at some logic there. Um, reversing a string, we'll look at some different ways to do that. Uh, using iteration or, or array functions. Data collection, so we'll collect data and put it in an object and then report it back to the user. Character count, we'll take strings and we'll count the characters and report back in sorted order what characters were entered. We'll do have a do-it-yourself where you create a list, so you'll create an array based on data collected from the user. And then a guessing game, this is an optional um, exercise you can do. The code's kind of given to you here in snippets if you want to understand how you might set up a guessing game with JavaScript. So, um, and then you'll just be turning in, you know, an assignment there. All right, let's get on with it then. All right, let's get set up to work on this by um, 
we will first uh, we, we will first fork this from SU Web Dev to local GitHub account. And once we've got it forked, we can clone it locally. So I'm going to grab that address, go to my command line, and git clone. And then bring it up with Visual Studio Code Node 2. All right, and we're ready to go. And we want to work on FizzBuzz before FizzBuzz Fun and reverse string before reverse iteration. So let's get started. All right, so what we're going to do now is start work on the FizzBuzz. And I've marked this required. Um, and this is, a, this is an implementation of a program that copies a child's game and children sit in a circle and they count off one, two, three, four. And if they're through, if the number they are at is be divisible by three, they say fizz. If it's divisible by five, they say buzz. If it's divisible by 15, they say fizz buzz. So they are keeping track of what's divisible by three, five, and 15. And what we'll do is we'll uh, take in a number and then we'll do a counter from one to that number. And we will output one, you know, we'll, we'll output the number alone if it's not divisible by three, five, or 15. And we'll output three, five, bit fizz buzz or fizz buzz if it's divisible by three, five, or 15. So let's get going with this. It'll make more sense. And if we look at the code that we're starting with, we, um, part of the these assignments, you will be filling in this um, comment section yourself. So you'll provide a description and input and output what the user would input, what they're going to see, and a usage statement if, if there is one. So um, that I'm going to leave to you, but we'll get going with uh, working through the to-dos. So um, aside from that comment template, the to-do for checking an integer argument. And um, here we are going to use our isNan input. So we're working with args here, um, as we did in the last assignment. We'll get an input. We'll just always double check that if we're expecting an integer, it's an integer. And otherwise, we'll output a usage. That would be fizzbuzz and then the integer. Um, and then um, process exit one. So uh, we would want to get out. And, we're, and the exit one is just going to let the system know that we ended it with an error. But uh, let's go ahead and just copy and paste that into this to-do. So we have a to-do to check for the integer input. And so in previous uh, code, we did an if then else, you know, an if else, and, and just put our else. But this is acting kind of like what we call a guard statement. It just says we're getting out of here. Uh, we're not going to continue to do any processing if we don't get what we're expecting. So that's just another way to do that. And then we're going to set up um, a loop that will iterate from one to the value of the input. So we're going to uh, just set up uh, let i equal one. And this will be in a for loop. That The for loop is provided, but we're going to provide the, log the expression for that loop. And again, those for loop, a for loop done in this way, it's, it, it initializes the loop. It tests if it's done with the loop. So we're going to go up to less than or equal to will take us up to the value input in inclusive. And then we're going to iterate one at a time. So every time we, we do a round of statements within this block between these curly braces, we will be using a set value of i. And when we get done, we will increment that value. So we've got our iteration. Um, we're going to look at some more ways to iterate, but this uh, definitely will move us through one at a time. And this is kind of a traditional a for loop that you will see code like this in many of the C family languages of which JavaScript is one of. So the to do is to do the test for 3, 5, and 15. So the way this is set up already is we are outputting the value of i and fizzbuzz to start. So in order to output fizzbuzz, we would need to do a test for div, you know, for the mod 15. 
And we, if you remember, we did odd even tests using mod 2. Well, it's going to be very similar for testing divisibility by 15. Uh, and then we will want to put out fizz, which will be actually divisible by 3. So fizz divisible by 3. So if you divide by 3, we get fizz. And then buzz will be divisible by 5. All right. So the order on this matters to the degree that if I, because these console logs put a new line in, if I tested for three first, it's true I would put out, I would put out the fizz, but with this else if, I would never get to test for five. And if I, even if I could, even if I change that logic a little, it would go on the next line. So really, when I'm dealing with this new line, it's going to look like this. And we'll see another way to do this in uh, the revert in the FizzBuzz fun. We're going to use iteration, and we'll see another way to do this. But logically, it makes sense to do FizzBuzz, and then do three and five. And since they're mutually exclusive by the else if, we won't have a problem. And then the and then at the end, the else gives us sort of the default. If none of those logical extra expressions match, we just put out the number. So let's test this, and. We can just node one fizzbuzz. So first, if I do it like that, I haven't provided a number to count off of. I'm going to get the usage statement. And same if I don't provide an integer, I won't be able to do this. So let's say if I go, um, if I go to seven, you can see I get a number, a number, and then divisible by three is fizz, divisible by five buzz and fizzbuzz. If I go to 15, I get fizz buzz every, you know, divide by three, divide by five, and fizz buzz divide by three and five. So this is looking good. Um, I think I'll just check this in. This is one fizz buzz. And these comments are really for me to keep track of my work or if I wanted to roll back. All right, so that is the FizzBuzz. And the next thing we're going to look at will be the FizzBuzz Fun. All right, FizzBuzz Fun, and the, and the fun in there is function. So we're going to be extracting. You can see right now there is no index.js. We're going to be extracting. We're going to kind of be refactoring is the term this fizzbuzz to use uh, some fu a function. And let's just look at the notes on that. So um, once we get fizzbuzz working above, then we can copy it, the, the index.js, into the fizzbuzz fun. And then we're going to replace the loop that we had with a call to a function called fizzbuzz. And our function is going to contain the logic that we previously just had right in line. So we're using the standard function notation here, um, function named fizzbuzz, passing it a value, and then having it report back fizzbuzz, fizzbuzz, or an empty string. Um, because in the, in the main part of the program, we will be reporting the value of the counter and the result of fizzbuzz. So let's take a look at how that's going to work. First of all, we're going to grab this index.js and we're going to copy it. So I'm just using control C, control V, and I am going to leave it to you to fill out the comments. So that will be part of the grading there. But um, what we want to do in here then is we've got the, we've got the basic setup to get the integer, to make sure it's an integer. But now, instead of in our for loop doing all of this code and all this logic, which could get messy, we are going to just uh, console log. So we're going to replace all of that. By the way, I see that I left my to do up there. So I'm going to go back up to one. And important thing is to clean out those to dos. 
So you can leave them as, as uh, comments if it makes sense, but you want to remove those. So we're going to end up we're going to end up actually removing all of this uh, in favor of creating a fizzbuzz function. Okay, so and the function in JavaScript, you know, using this straight JavaScript, we need that function to be defined before we use it. So we're going to go up above where we're using it and we're going to define function fizzbuzz and it will take some value and it will uh, perform some tests and so we can see that it's going to do our n15 so the, so in speaking of how we we're passing in an i so i is the argument and n is receiving is the value received is the parameter so when we're processing in this code block here between here and here and we we're referring to n not i because we've we've essentially alias that i with this variable n um, and that's common to see that your, your variable and your argument do not require the same to be named the same um, because they can be in very different parts of the code. In fact, you know, if this function was in a separate file, I would, and from the, from the use of it, so say I created a file just to hold functions and then I wanted to call that function, I would need that file to be uh, included as a module somehow and required in before I used it. All right, um, so now that we are using this function call, and this is just you know nice thing about uh, using the, the template literals is we can make a function call right inside. So let's just take a look and see how that works. This is gonna be a call to node one fun fun. And we get our usage down here, and there it is. Then, uh, if we pass in 30, we get our fizzbuzz, just like we did before. So we've extracted the code out of the main line and created a function to hold it. And in fact, if we wanted to call that fizzbuzz functionality to find out if our value was a fizz or a buzz, we could we could just call this function from anywhere. All right, so that looks good. I'm going to go ahead and push that. So I like to push frequently. All right. All right, uh, now we're moving on to reverse a string. So we've got two of them. One, we're, we're going to do it two different ways. Um, in one way, we will be using array functions. So let's take a look at the notes here. Um, so in reverse a string, we're going to, of course, check to see that we got a string, provide usage, and then we're going to use some array functions. So if you look at this, uh, our input is going to be a string. And we're going to call a split function and give it an empty string. So split um, will take that string and divide it up into characters, and I will end up with a, an array of characters. Once I have an array, I can use array functions that are very, very uh, useful. And I can reverse the order of the items in the array. Then I still have an array. I can call the join function on the array, which takes my array items and puts them back together in a string separated by whatever character I give here, which since it's an empty string, basically glues it back together. So split takes a string that allows, that ends up separating whatever you've split your string um, into. So if I had a string AB and I had a split character 1, it would end up A1B. But with an empty string, it just splits it into a b um, and then join is kind of the opposite of split only it, it um, puts the the string back in so if that makes sense oh actually split is looking for that character to split on so if i had a comma b and i split on comma i would end up with a b in my in my array but in join it's what glues them back together so if i had two values in an array, like if 
let, let's just take a look at that here. So since we're in the browser, you can go to the console and I could have like a string, let's say let s equal a comma b. And if I do um, let a equal s dot split on comma, and then if I look at A, you can see it created an array with two characters. Uh, then if I do, uh, if I want, so let's say I wanted them to end up back in an array, but split, but separated by a pipe. So then I could say A join and use the pipe character. And then I have them joined by a pipe. So split and join are really handy. And then of course the reverse um, allows me to, um, it works only on an array, not on a string. But once I've got it split, I can call reverse and then I join it back together. So that's what we're gonna use um, to do that. So first of all, if we're looking at the to-dos, we wanna check that the string is a string. and Otherwise, we're just going to provide usage and get out. So we just, and you can see we're using the falsy there. We're saying if it's not input, okay, if it's, if it's an empty string, don't bother looking. If, it, if it's not empty, well, here's another test for empty. We would need it to have a length. So if it was null, say, it would um, fail that. But you could have an empty string, and but if it had a length of zero, I wouldn't want to process it. Uh, so length is a property. It's not a function. It's not like a string method, but it's a property of, of uh, strings and arrays as well. So it's a really handy way to test if there's anything in a string. Um, and then um, here we've just uh, gone ahead and logged that. So not a whole lot to do in this particular function, but you do want to fill in the comment template. So that's, I'll leave that for you. So let's test that. So node to reverse and empty string. Uh, yes, I'm gonna get my, my usage there. And um, if I run this with hello, it comes out backwards. If I run it with, if I wanna, you know, hello there, it's going to come out backwards like that. So there's a lot of fun things you can do with this. Um, for instance, you could, if you wanted to uh, split this, remove the space and reverse it that way. So you, you can kind of play around with those, but this, this is used in a lot of uh, questions, interview questions, you know, reverse a string. And we're gonna see in the next uh, reverse a string iterate uh, how, another way that we can reverse a string. But this is a way that you can do it basically in one line. So be sure you look at that and, and feel that you can understand and, and duplicate that. By the way, it doesn't matter if I use uh, single quotes or double quotes as long as any quoting ends with the same thing that it starts with. So I should try to be more consistent. Generally, I'm a double quote person, but I think many people are single quote people. But anyway, as long as it starts and ends, it will process okay. Okay, now we're gonna look at uh, reverse, this is to reverse string iterate. And in this case, we don't have an index. So let's take a look at the instructions here. This is required. Um, what we're going to do is copy the index from the first one. Um, and we're, we're going to mainly what we're going to get out of that is our testing for uh, that we have a string. So let's go ahead and copy this. Control Z, Control V. And uh, let's see, oops, did I copy that in the wrong place? Control Z, Control, Reverse String Iterate. Okay, that's in the right place. Um, and again, you're going to want to fill out these uh, uh, comment at the top using that template. You've, you're getting the test for whether this is a a string that we were going to get input, a string arg, and then we're going to test for it. Um, but what we're going to change is this console log because we're not going to be using the split reverse join on it. 
And instead, we're going to use iteration to check for it. And we're going to create a function with iteration. So I'm calling this function reverse with full iteration. It takes a string. And what's going to happen is I'm going to create a local variable and that let. So this result that will only be known between the curly braces supplied with the function. And we're going to initialize that to an empty string. And then we're going to work back back to uh, backwards and forwards to, um, to build this string. So if you look at this, um, so if you picture hello, I inst instead of iterating from 0 to the length of the string, minus 1, I will iterate backwards. So from the length of the string, minus 1, and it's minus 1 because we start counting at 0, till I get to greater than or equal to 0. So I just, and then with each character that I that I get in that iteration so I pull out the string character um, remember strings are immutable I can't change it but I can read each character then I use an assignment operator to assign it to this result string so let's take a look at this we'll, we'll um, grab that function um, and you know I suggest you know you if you want type this out sometimes people tell me it it, copy and paste just leaves them not understanding, but if they type it and debug it, it helps. So either way, we're gonna we have a function that has a string parameter, and it's going to build up a result one character at a time by working back to front. And so I will be able to then in the main line of the program, I will just result with full iteration. I will just call that function, pass in the input and it should log that for me. Um, you can see I'm using comma here. I'm not using a template literal. And so I should just output this string and then a space and then the result of the string. And once again, console log will take whatever value that you happen to have and turn it into a string. So uh, let's go ahead and run that. So this is node to reverse string iterate. And we'll just do our hello. And you can see that it re reverse with full iteration gave us this, um, this, this string. Um, we also have another. So when you're doing these kinds of algorithms, you know, a lot of them involve iteration. Uh, there can often be a question, well, can I make that more efficient? Yes, and the answer is yes, you can make it more efficient. So. Um, rather than having to look at each and every character in the string that I'm going to reverse, I can actually just go through half of that string. So uh, let's see if I clear this. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, let's see. Um, oh, we'll just clear this here. If I have this string hello, if you look at that, I have, um, if I can swap if I can swap characters like first and last, so first and fifth character, second and fourth character, and then because it's odd number, the, the L will stay, I can essentially in several steps um, have it be O-E-L-L-H, right? Just swapping the H and the O, and then uh, it would be O-L-L-E-H. So in, in two steps rather than five steps, I can end up with my reverse string. And to do that in code, all I need to do is to divide, just iterate from the beginning to halfway through the length of the string. Um, so if I'm starting here at the beginning, um, and it, this works with even or odd because on um, this we will not with this uh, string dot length over two that we don't see like for five we don't see two and a half we just see two so we're zero one two that takes us to the third position and um, and then all we're doing is we've got this uh, array so we can set arrays we can't set strings but we will we'll actually set just as I did before we'll set the the ith or zeroth with the whatever was in string length minus one which is the o so we'll, we'll set the o to the front and we'll then we'll set 
the i minus the length minus one to what was um, in in the with that what was in the front. So we'll set the back to the front. So if you look at this, is setting the front to what was at the end after the halfway point, and this is setting what was um, at the beginning into what was at the end. So we're just kind of marching from both directions, swapping as we go. So that's a more efficient algorithm than having to look through the whole thing. And then of course we can run our result join because we have an array to get that. So let's just take and copy that. And you know, sometimes if you want to explore this, um, what you can do at each step is you can put a console login. So you can kind of see what does this result look like at each step, console log result. Yeah, so we, I might, I always label these so that I know what to look for a result. So um, we're, not, we have, we're gonna get to debugging, but right now this, using console log like this is a good way to debug. And then once I've got that, I can then just uh, make my log call to um, call that function. The reverse with, so I'm calling it with reverse half iteration. So let's run this again. And of course we'll still, we were gonna run the, this was with it, with full iteration. And now because I've got that console log in there, um, it's showing me the result. So let's see if this is, if this makes any sense. So we've got four empty items and that's because it's showing us that yeah, we started out with an empty array. Now we have an H in there, and then we have the two empty items in between this um, O and E. So we filled in some of it, and then finally we filled in all of it. So with each iteration, we are adding two items to it. I believe that should be what we're doing. So. Yes. Let me see if I can make this, because it's an array, it's a little bit harder to see. What If in our debugging statement we did our join, what would we, how would that look? So now we're taking our result at each step and joining it. Just trying to make this a little clearer. So you can see at the first step we've got an H, and then we have the OEH, and then the OLLEH. So We've managed by through um, three steps to to do it rather than the five that would have been required to go the full to do the full iteration. All right. Well, if I you know you can kind of play around with that and, and kind of work through that. Sometimes it helps to create a column, you know, and look at the iteration the the, the iteration step and what the result looks like at each step through this iteration. But I'm gonna comment this out because I don't really want that to show up. So in the end, that's what it's gonna look like. So we have full iteration and half iteration. Okay, let's check this in. So this just, um, this just shows a, a totally different way to go about reversing a string from, from using Obviously, the, it's less code using the um, using the array functions. It was just one line of code. This is more code, but I think this gets you deeper into understanding um, how iteration works and how it could be applied to to solving uh, algorithmic types of problems. All right, so let's leave behind that, and what we want to look at now is data collection. So with data collection, um, here what we're going to do is we're going we're to set up an array of objects that contain questions. And they have, in objects, we always have a key value pair um, or pairs. So we're going to have objects that contain two key value pairs. One we've labeled the key. So that doesn't have anything to do with, so this is the key, this is the value. Here question is the key. This question is the value, but we speak of key value pairs in an object. So our objects are uh, designated by the curly braces and we have an array of them. So you can see that you can nest, you can nest objects in arrays. You can also nest arrays within objects. So 
But looking at this, we have a list of questions and they have keys so that as we get the answers to these questions, we can save them in another object using that key. So for example, if it says, what's your name? And I say, Joe, then I can save then in a new object, I can create a key value pair named Joe. So I can collect data in this way. Now in this assignment too, we are going to be using our IO module, but we're going to be using a prompt to do it. So we're going to be setting, rather than collecting data from the args off of the command line, we're going to actually ask the, we're going to prompt the user to enter something and then we're going to collect the data. And so this is going to be uh, something, a new look uh, to data collection. Um, and it's going to use, um, with the prompts we're using, the node read line, which will be asynchronous. And generally, when you're dealing with user input, it is asynchronous because you, you don't want to wait for that. I mean, you want, you need to, your code in some way needs to kind of uh, stop and be prepared to collect any input from them. But you may want to let the code continue to run in general. In fact, it kind of creates another type of loop where it's because it appears to be waiting to the user, it's like we can kind of put them in a loop. Well, let's get it going so that you can see what it looks like. First of all, we can pull up these instructions, data collection. So the first thing is we're going to include our, um, our IO. This is our local modules so that we have access to functions and the function that we're pulling this time will be this IO and uh, you know if you look at this you can see there's there's a print which is essentially console log so this just really shows you how process process standard out write this is how node writes to the terminal and it just takes this message and writes it out with a new line so this is exactly equivalent to doing a console log um, and then it also has this terminal function, which is going to uh, use this node read line, um, and it's going to create an interface around standard in and standard out, which essentially are the terminal input and output. So that may not make much sense, but read line brings a lot of functionality, in particular uh, the ability to determine when the user has hit a new line, like hit the enter key, um, and it can be closed. There's a lot you could go read about it. Um, you don't have to worry too much about this, but you'll see how we use that in, in processing. So first of all, I, once I get that I.O., um, now I'm going to initialize my user data. So this is where I will collect my user data. So here's my list of questions, and you could add more questions if you want. But these are initial list of questions. What's your name? What's your favorite color? What's your number? And I will be storing those in this user data object. So I'm initializing it with just the curly braces. And then I'm going to initialize a counter because um, I do need to um, keep track of which question I'm on so that I don't try to ask a try to ask for a question that doesn't exist. In other words, um, oh, and it looks like I've already got it initialized there. So we've got that already done for us. So we'll just take that to do out. So we've got a counter, we've got the user data. Um, next thing we're looking for is set a question prompt based on the counter. So we want to cover all of the three questions. And so to initialize, we, we are going to set, and this comes with that terminal using readline. Readline comes with a set prompt that I can put a prompt in and a prompt will just be a string and this string it looks kind of complicated here is our question keys counter so initially it'll be the zeroth item in question keys which will be name and it's the question that the que using this question um, key essentially in here so this whole expression here is going to evaluate to what is your name. So if, if that looks complicated, take a minute to look at it. The one gets us the first item in question keys and the question gets us the value, what is your name? Okay, so that sets, that, that, that sets up the prompt. And then when I call IO terminal prompt, that has 
the program outputs that prompt into the terminal. So that question comes up and it's just going to sit there. And the, um, so what we need to do after that is to start gathering answers. And we do that with the, this IO terminal using the event online. So this is new handling, setting up events in Node. The, the on says, okay, I'm going to listen for an event and it's the line event, which is when the user does a line feed, which they do by usually hitting the return or the enter key. And this function on this handler takes itself takes a function. And this function is where I'm going to be able to process what the user entered. So it will automatically give me a response value. And I can just now use that value to do things. And so um, so what we're going to do is get the current question and then we are going to um, get the key and use that to save the response into our new user data. So if we look at this we have we're going to get the current question and then we're going to load the data. Let's take a look at this here. So we we set up a local variable current question and it will be our question keys counter. So that'll be our first question the first time through this through this um, since counters initialized to zero. And once we have that, we can use the current question to get the key. So the key on the current question, the value of that key is name. And so we can now, in our user data, use that key to create a, a key for our response. So we'll say user data name equals whatever the user typed in. So that it might take a little thinking to think through how that all works. But basically, all we're doing is we're going to pull this. We're going to uh, use the um, the key that came with that question as the key for where we how we store the data. So we and we will do that in our user data and we'll see what that looks like here in a minute. Um, the next thing that we want to do is to increment the counter and we can just use this plus plus which does it's it's a shortcut for saying counter equals counter plus one. So plus plus means plus add one minus minus would be subtract one and it just does it to, to the to the variable itself. So we'll increment the counter so that on the next question we can go to the second item in the array and pull this what is your favorite color um, out. So we increment the counter and then we do a logical test to see if we're done with all the questions and that what do you think that's going to be? That's going to be is our counter um, have we gotten to the place where our counter is, is greater than or equal to the length of the question keys. And so what that's saying, we know that our question keys length is three. Okay, so because that's how we've set up this question, three objects. If the counter goes up to four, why well, then we're done. We don't if it or even if it's equal to three, we don't want to go to four. We don't want to try to access question keys with a value of four up here. Or even actually, you know, is as it turns out, since we count from zero, we we are going to count values zero, one, and two. We don't even want to use the value three, or we'll be going over the the counter. I mean, we can only access question keys zero, question keys one, and question keys two. So what we test for is that if we're greater than or equal to, if our counter has gotten to three, we're done. And we can call this close. Um, so that's our logical expression to tell that we're done. Otherwise, we go to the next question. And to get to the next question, we just use our, we can just use our next question. So, so we had our, our next question, and it's going to be, again, a local variable. It's not going to interact outside of this curly braces and we can just grab that next question 
set it up in a prompt and call the prompt. So this just keeps us in question mode. So if we hit the end of the key of the list of questions, we close. Otherwise, we go get another question prompt for it. Um, and then we are provided with in the read line, um, which we're calling, which we've got encased in this terminal, we have the ability to listen for close. So when close gets, we say questions complete. And then we have a to do to loop through the keys in our object, which is that uh, user data object. And where did we set that? Yes, up here in this. Now we're going to actually want to loop through this user data object and report on it. So using the key value pairs that we collected, we want to report on that. And this is where when looping through a, an object, not an array, but a, just a straight object, we use the for in syntax. So we're going to just grab that and let's take a look at that here. I'm going to format this here. Let's see. So you can see, I can get rid of this to do. Actually, I'll keep the. We're going to, so we're going to loop through user data. So, and we just pull each, each, uh, each key. This for in grabs the keys out of the object. So for each key, I'm going to call it D. For each D in user data, I'm going to print out the key and then I'm going to print out the value. And I get to the value by using user data and then the bracket notation D. So this is how you access a variable uh, key, a value for a variable key. You use the bracket notation. Okay, so let's just let's run this and just see what happens. Maybe that will make more sense here. So, um, so here we're running node three data collection and there's no arguments. You notice it says, what is your name? I'll just say Joe and my favorite color blue and your favorite number seven. And at that point, it tells me questions complete and it reports back key value, key value, key value. So we went from key question, given key question values to given key answers. All right, so that's all there is to that. Let's push that in there and get the commit again. Okay. All right, so let's move on then. All right, so let's uh, move on to character count. And this is a really useful little program and it helps to illustrate a couple of things. One, it's going to help us to learn about the difference between uh, using, uh, needing to have something unique, which objects, key value pairs can provide, and needing to have something ordered, which arrays can provide. So let's take a look at the instructions here. This is required. Um, we're going we've given a lot of code snippets, so we're just going to work through that. So, um, and again, you're going to be wanting to fill out the comments here once you totally understand what's going on here, the inputs, the outputs, what's going on. So in this case, what we're going to be doing is letting the user enter a string and they can, you know, use quotes if they have a lot of spaces or if they have any spaces in the string. Um, so we want to check, you know, and make sure that we have a string. And then, um, oh, actually, no, there, this is not an arg. This is a, we're going to be doing this through the, through the read line with the set prompt. So we'll be prompting them to enter a string and then we will um, process that string into a set of characters and we'll count each, we'll, we'll keep a count for each character. So this is where objects can be really useful because we can have a unique set of characters and the, the key can be the character and the value can be the count. So we'll end up with a count and then um, we can convert that into, um, in order to, we want to have it be reported in order. So what's the, you know, I think it's going to come ascending order, the least to most characters used. We can actually convert that 
um, object into an array, and arrays, because they are in order, can be sorted. And we'll see how to sort an array, and then we will just report on the characters and the count. So we're going to be able to ultimately take any string that the user enters and report back all the characters and how many of each were used in order. So let's start in on this. We've got we've got our I.O. in here, so we're going to be able to do the counting. We're going to now set up, uh, initialize this character count array. And then we're going to set a prompt for the to, to enter the string. So we're using our I.O. terminal to do that. And we'll just say enter a string to analyze. So we can we can keep the comments, but remove the to-dos. And then we call the prompt, so that will cause that, that to be displayed. Um, and with that, we are now ready to listen for the user's input. And in particular, when they hit the Enter key, we can do some processing. So the first thing is we're going to split the, the string into an array. And we've, we've already worked with that. So that's just using the split command. Um, and now we have this characters. And it's going to be an array where each character in the string is going to be represented by an item in the array. Then we're going to iterate through the array and create an object for each character for the key and a count value. So what we need to do here is we're going to, we're going to do a, a for of, because we're going through an array, pull out each character, see if that character is in our care count. So our care count is an object, and we can access the, the value of each key. So in this, the ultimate uh, structure of this object is that we have the key is going to be a character. So if I entered A, the key would be A, and then the value is the count, so that would be 1. And so we're going to test first to see, you know, and we've got this, this truthy falsy test, Does have we recorded this particular character yet? Can I find it in my object? And if I can, I'm just going to increment it. And if I can't, I'm going to set it to 1. So this will say, OK, I, I do have one now, and its value will be 1. If I already have one, I'm just going to increment that. So if you know if that doesn't quite make sense right away, think about that a little bit. It's, um, so it, it's, I think you'll, you'll see you, it'll help you to appreciate the structure. And I mean, if I was to. Um, show you what this structure looked like. If I say if I entered hello, I would have h1, e, 1, l, 2, o, 1, right? That would be the structure of it. However, I can't guarantee it would be in that order, because there's no order to it. Um, but that would be what the structure of it would look like. Um, and this little loop here would take care of filling that in for any for any string I had. And then I'm going to close. I'm done processing. And then I'm going to listen for the close. So once I'm done processing, now what I want to do is turn that object into an array and sort it and then report on it. So um, to turn it into an array, I am going to just go through this. I'm going to use the for in to loop through my object keys. And then I'm going to push the values into this character array. So let's see. I've initialized character array here. So this is just an empty array. And now I do this little loop that goes through the keys in the char count, which is my object. And it sets up new key value pairs. So I'll have a char. Um, so it's actually going to create an array of objects where there will be a, a, a character an account, and the character will be whatever was in the key that I'm iterating through, and the count will be the value associated with that key. So I'm creating an array of objects out of this uh, single object. It's still not going to be in order, but it's now in an array, which means that it can be ordered. So um, that this step, um, let's just. I think it might be useful to save that. 
iterate through, yeah, so we want to iterate through, yeah, sort based on count. Yeah, so first of all, we, we do need, uh, let's see, we do need to, in order to sort it, we do need to run through our loop and fill up our char array with objects that contain a character and a count. And then to sort it, we can call the array sort function. And this is a little bit different uh, looking. Um, what's happening here in the sort <clears throat> is that I take my array and it has um, two, it takes two values, A and B. And that, those represent the, um, the, the character coming in and then the next character. So kind of like uh, this character and the next character. So if I'm marching through an array, and in fact not character but object, so I'm marching through my array, I have a set of objects that are made up of the key value pair char and count, and I'm able to compare A and B. So for each set of objects as I move through this array, um, I can compare values within those objects. And in fact, in order to sort in an ascending order, I need to set it up so that if a is less than b, I return negative 1. And in this case, a.count less than b.count return negative 1. Else, if a.count is greater than b.count, I return positive 1. So that indicates that um, a greater than is has been viewed. And then um, I return 0 if they're equal. So um, this is, not sure what the TOD is, to indicate equal. So what I've got now is at the end of this, so it uses this kind of, it's, it's a little, this function to process the items in the array with respect to each other and it and then it sorts them out and I end up actually changing the order within char array. So now char array contains all the values of, that I originally created, only now they're sorted by count in ascending order. Uh, and now I'm ready to just go ahead and loop through my uh, array, char array, and report it. So to do that, I'm just going to use a for of and I can take out that. And I'll just pull out, and you can call this is just a variable, you can call it whatever you want, whatever you call it is what you refer to it in the function or in the block here. Um, so for each row in row array, I'm going to report the character and the count. So let's go ahead and run that. And we have node for character count. And this is something, again, you if you were interviewing for a JavaScript job, you could definitely get asked this question. So hi, what is your name? I could Your user can type in whatever they want there, and it is going to analyze it. So I the, it turns out space has the most entries, so four for space. So there's one of each of those characters, two H's, two I's, two A's. So this will analyze how many characters and then report it in ascending order. And it turns out if you wanted it in descending order, you would just flip this test. So let's just try that. So if I wanted it in descending order, I just report that. And uh, let's see. Hi, what is your name? So now you can see that it goes in descending order. So that, it takes a little bit of looking at this and maybe reading about it to fully understand how this sort function works. But basically, you're just comparing items one at a time and returning 0, 1, or minus 1. Um, OK, that looks good. Let's check it in. So I think it is important to check this in as you go. Don't wait till the end because this this you may this may take you a couple sessions to get through these tutorials, um, and you don't want to lose any work that you've done. Now we're going to look at this five create list, and this is a DIY do it yourself. So when when you look at this code, there really is nothing in here but to dos, and you're not given any code 
snippets to work through. So you really just have to work through this on your own. And we're using, um, the idea of this one is we are using an array to collect data from the terminal. So the user will be prompted um, to enter first item. They'll enter something. And then we'll go into the loop where we can keep collecting more data. So um, we'll start by, we'll use the array push command to get the data into the array. And then when the user, um, he, they'll be prompted again when the user enters a string quit, then we will be done and we will exit the loop, the prompt loop, and we will uh, report back that the list is complete and what the user entered. So let's get in and write this little program. This is kind of a, an important program in the fact that it's, it's kind of like um, the collect data, data collection that we did where we put data into an object. Now we're loading up an array. So we're just you know using an ordered list to collect this data. So let's start in. We've actually got the, um, we've got the main comments already set up for us. Uh, but we're starting in with creating a to-do module. So we're going to use our const IO, uh, sorry, an IO module, and require in our modules IO. And again, we've been working with, um, with being able to prompt the user and um, in an, when the user hits a, the enter key, which generates a line feed, we're detecting that and we can then grab that data and do something with it. So we've got our IO and then now we want to declare a const list. Now um, we're going to set this list equal to an array object. Now because it's an object we can modify the values inside of it even though it's const. So we couldn't we could not say you know list now equals an object. We can't change what the list variable is pointing to but we can add data inside of this list because it because remember an array is an object. And the next thing we want to do is prompt for the first item. So we can io.terminal prompt and we'll say first and I just like to use the back tick because it just kind of keeps it keeps it standardized. And so we'll set up our prompt to enter first item and then we will prompt for that. Okay, so at that point, we are just going to uh, be calling for the first item and prompting. Now, to gather the answers, we need to set up our, our handler for responses. So the terminal um, on line, we're going to have a callback function response and this will be the, our loop for gathering up responses and the first thing that we want to do is before we do anything we want to test is this response equal to quit because if it's quit then we really don't want to you know add it to the list or continue prompting so we want to also use this this string method to lowercase. You can test for lowercase and uppercase because if, for instance, a user entered capital D or capital Q U I T instead of lowercase Q, they still probably meant quit. So um, we're giving them a little leeway on case sensitivity, um, but we'll make it a triple equal quit. Okay, and then um, so we've got a good test there for quit. So this would go along uh, with this part here. So we're testing for quit just to keep that kind of lined up. So if they enter quit, then all we have to do is close out this terminal. Terminal close. Okay, and that will take them out to do whatever we want to do once the terminal's done. Um, Otherwise, so we'll do an else, we're going to prompt for next item. Okay. Uh, also, oh, we want to prompt for next item. Oh, and use the push command to add. So yes, this is part of this. So in this else, 
we will use the push command to add the response to the list. So list.push response. Okay. And then we're going to set up another prompt. This prompt, instead of saying first item, we'll say terminal prompt uh, next item. All right, and then we'll run our prompt. So we've kind of got this loop running, this prompt looped, looped. Okay, and so that will just keep asking until until they hit quit, we will just stay in this loop that's set up by our event handler to just keep asking for that. And, um, and then once we're out of that, then we are going to, so once we're, let's see, we want to look for the end of this. Yes, so once we're out of that, now we want to process what we want to do on close, which will be we want to print close complete. And we can do that using our, we can set that up by doing, we have this IO on, um, we can have this do a an on close. So when it closes, we will do a function. So, so this only runs once once the, that close command has been initiated. So we have our IO on close. Let's see, is that all lining up correctly? We have our IO on and then we have the close. Okay, so let's see if we can format this. So yes, we have our IO online and then we have our on close. And once we're in this close, we're going to do an IO print or you could do a console log, same thing. List complete, just putting something out on the terminal with a, with a new line. And then for, so we're doing this list complete and then iterate through the list of all items entered by the user. So we can do our for of, so let item of list, and we'll just use IO print dollar item. All right, let's take a look and see how that runs. Um, so node five, okay. It's not exactly what we would have expected. Let's take a look at what's going on here. All right, this is a typo on my part. So when I'm setting up my prompt, that's not prompt, that should be set prompt. So we, we have something output. And I have one more of these set prompt. Okay, let's try this again. So first item, test, next item, does this work? And then quit. So quit should not show up in my list, but it should terminate this. So test, does this work? And yes, it does. So at this point, let's just do some cleanup. We want to remove our to-dos. If you wanted to, you could put in some, you could turn to-dos into, into comments. So that's not a bad thing to do, but you don't want to leave the to-do itself. Uh, it's, it's just incomplete. And so use the next command. If it's an obvious what's going on, then you don't really need to comment it. But where it's not obvious, of course, it's nice to have it commented. All right, so let's just test that again. Um, and if I quit, nothing, okay. But if I add some stuff and quit, you can see it added an empty string. So that's all looking good. We got it cleaned up. It's commented. So get add, get commit. Um, um, add code. All right, looks good. 
Hey, uh, we have one more um, bit of code that we can write, and this one I'm giving it to you as optional. Um, it, I don't know that you need to do this, um, but in many scripting languages provide a guessing game, and so I wanted to provide that here in Node um, so that you can run this from the command line. And so what's going to happen here is if you want to do this, you could, it's, I encourage you to do this. It, it, the code snippets are provided. Um, it's not a do-it-yourself, but just some more work if you if you want to look at it though. But in any case, um, this is a game where, and you could use similar functionality for a roll of the die, where we will use a math object that is provided in JavaScript, and it has a, a number of functions. You can you can go Google that and see them. And in particular, it provides a random function so we can get a random number. And this math.random actually returns a uh, um, a fractional number, so it's with a decimal point. So usually what we do, if you want to get um, a number between 1 and 10, what we would do is multiply by 10, that random number, take the floor of that, so kind of wipe out the decimal part and add 1. You know, if I wanted it between 1 and 20, I would use 20 here and then still add 1. So this is kind of a standard technique for getting a random number between two values. Um, so let's, and then, and then the idea is um, uh, the computer comes up with a random number, and then the user is prompted to guess what number it is. If they guess correctly, they win, and if they don't, they lose, and they only get three guesses. Now you can change those parameters if you want, but basically that's the idea of this game. And so we have some code snippets to help out with that. So let's go take a look at what's going on. And here we have an index.js. So first of all, we want to create a variable n that contains this random number between 1 and 10. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this rather than fumble through typing that. So, and I'd probably take out the to-do, but maybe keep the, the comment. And then, uh, I'm going to initialize the guess count. So this guess count is where I keep track of how many guesses they're allowed. So it's not um, what they're guessing, it's how many times they get to guess. And then I'm bringing in the uh, IO again so I can do some prompting. And I'm going to actually write a function get ordinal. So it'll take a number, an integer and between 1 and 3, and turn it into first, second, or third. So I just want that kind of English language um, instead of saying turn one, turn two, or whatever. I'm going to do that, and it's and it's kind of a a, a very simple little function here. Get ordinal. I just test the value, and if it's one, I first, second, third. Otherwise, I'm if they put in a four, I'll return four. Um, it, it's really intended. It's not a super transferable function, but just to kind of get you thinking about the logic and the testing and the if else. So um, let's see. So we're going to, uh, oh yes, do the get order. And that, I've, I've got to have that function up above any place that I'm going to be calling it. So I'm going to put it outside of my guessing. My, so I'll set up a guessing loop with this prompt. So first of all, I set the prompt to uh, three guesses, guess a number between 0 and 10. Um, and actually, that should be really between 1 and 10. Let's say 1 to 10. And then uh, we'll prompt. So that'll just put that out there and wait for an answer. We'll listen for a, a line. So in other words, we'll listen for them to hit enter, meaning they've entered something. Now, I probably should do some checking here as far as this is an integer. I haven't done that, but um, you um, definitely should do that. But let's take a look at what I've got. Um, oh, I do have some checking. So if it's not a number and if it equals n. So I'm setting up, I, I am setting up a loop, uh, a question here if it's not a number. So I am doing some something valuable as far as validation here. But notice, um, whatever they entered, I tried to parse int it. So if I do a parse int and it's not a number, then it would evaluate to not a number. 
and then I can do a test uh, to see if it's not a number. So uh, in that case, I could um, give give them a have them do something different, or just kind of ignore the ignore it and and count it as a failed guess. And then if response equals n, now I'm actually testing. Okay, it's a number. Is it the number that we set up as our random number? So let me just grab that response. So I'm just putting in these logical expressions now. And then if they guess the number, I'm going to say you win. And I'm going to restate the number is the number. Process exit 0, it means that they're exiting without an error. Um, otherwise, um, if they didn't guess my number, I'm going to let them know through an IO print, which is like console log that your get guess count, so that's going to, if it's the first guess, it'll say first guess, and whatever they said is incorrect. Okay, so this is just kind of processing, um, did they enter a number, and if they did, was it the right number or the wrong number? And um, I have here some comments, I, I'm not going to do these, but you can easily set that up to, to let them know if they get by testing the value they entered against the value that the random number, whether that was too big or too small to help them get closer quicker. So that would be something that you could do. Um, and then if, the, if you're done guessing, it's time to exit. So this would be where we want to find out, is our guess count greater than two? Remember, we only get three guesses. Um, I could test for is it equal, equal, equal three, but I'm just saying if the guess count's greater than two, then they've lost because um, we're, we're counting from zero, and so we're not going to let them go over zero, one, two, over three guesses. So you lose, it tells you the correct value, it closes, um, and uh, otherwise, if they, get, if, if they haven't passed their guess, then we're just going to call that prompt again. And I don't have to do a set prompt. It'll just call it with the same prompt that we had up here, which was, uh, you know, the, the, the three guesses that we just keep prompting. We're sort of in this, this prompt loop until they either guess it or they go over the count. So let's try and run this. And let's do. Oh, to do, I would detect the terminal is closing and say something. So yes, we do want to process the terminal close. And I'm just saying done and weaving gracefully, so not on an error. And so with that, I can now run the guessing game. And so guess a number between 1 and 10. And I get 4, 8, 7, 7. OK, so I lost. It was actually 9. So this is a guessing game. I mean, you could do this with, with again, you can use randomness for rolling dice. You know, guess, guess the value on two dice rolled. You can get more complex with your um, code on that. But this is, um, that is the guessing game. That is optional. I'll add this. Did. All right, so that's done. If you haven't looked at the video on debugging, take a look at that. That can help you with solving all of these problems, and it's a good skill to learn as well. You can always use console logs throughout your code to, to see the state of your data uh, or where you are, but debugging can really help too.